This slot is entitled Dangerous Conjunctures and Reproductive Relations, um, in which we want to discuss the constitutive relation of ever-shifting modes of gendered reproduction and racial capitalism. Now, in the last two days, the question of gender, and not only as a category of oppression and exclusion, but as a relation, so reproductive relations, as being foundational to the workings of racial capitalism and tied to the structural and ideological nation form, has been raised and thematized um, via a discussion of the feminization of work, the transnationalization of the household, and the privatization and economization of care and care work. The conjuncture of the social and the gendered contract was also touched upon yesterday, as well as the coloniality of gendered unpaid labor discussed on the basis of reproductive technologies. Wallerstein and Baliba already touched upon the role of sexism in race class nation as a basic institution of historical capitalism. And we want to push these discussions further in this slot by thinking about the conjunctions of race, nation, and class and reproductive relations. And we're very um, happy to have this discussion with um, Veronica Gago, Maya Indira Ganesh, Kaushik Sundar Rajan, Kelly Gillespie, and Dimitri Erasmus. Right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, Dimitri. And we're first going to show um, prompt images to then um, delve into the discussion. Thank you. So I would, um, yeah, just ask you to, if you either want to touch upon, of course, associatively on one of the images. Um, otherwise, I think it would be, um, or in relation to that, maybe good to um, even sketch out again or remind ourselves how a race-critical gender analysis um, goes beyond capitalism's underlying separation of production and social reproduction and how such an analysis to, can bring us also further in terms of, um, of the current conjuncture. Can I just add um, mm -hmm. one thing? Um, when one thinks uh, across you know, the longer form of recent history, uh, one could say that post-colonial, post-civil rights, post of apartheid feminist and class drives have been largely, if not exclusively, around the, the drive for visibility and recognition, and that has been under discussion over the past few days, and it's come up, not least in conversation with Francois Vergès, but also more generally, um, that the question perhaps needs to be uh, pressed regarding what the affordances and affordabilities of remaining in visibility or of going in and out of visibility sort of amount to politically. Uh, obviously made more possible by digitalities where things like avatars or digital identities um, can be both invoked and discarded um, you know, uh, more or less readily. Um, but the question of w what comes with visibility and what gets lost with visibility and what comes with invisibility and the possibility of political action it, you know, from, from outside of visibility or not fully visible and how one chooses to go in and out and who has a choice to go in and out of visibility uh, indeed. Um, questions of surveillance, of um, you know, Simone Brown's dark matters and, and so on and so forth. So just to put that as a question on the table as well. I'm happy to, mm -hmm. to go. Great. Um, 
Uh, actually, before we start, I just want to acknowledge and mention um, the brazen and brutal assassination of Marielle Franco, who um, a few days ago in, in, in Rio, um, not somebody that I actually knew about very much, but I've been really moved hearing about it the last few days and a lot of my Brazilian friends um, kind of talking about her life. So I just wanted to, to recognize and acknowledge her life um, and especially who she was in, in this particular context of talking about race, nation and class. Um, and just to kind of respond to what you were saying, David, actually I've been thinking a lot about, um, I think many of us in and out of the academy have been thinking a lot about this thing called the list uh, that has come up, mm -hmm. and I want to find a place to be able to talk about um, visibility through, I, I'm a technologist, I study technology, so I want to talk about violence and technology, and for those who don't know about it, um, maybe you know the more famous sibling of the list, which is the Me Too movement, mm -hmm. um, and it was kind of around the time when the Weinstein allegations came out that um, there was this really difficult, complicated thing that emerged on the internet, which was a list, a Google spreadsheet of um, abusive men in Indian academia. There was also a shitty media men list, which was happening at the same time. Um, but this, this list kind of like really touched a number of us, and uh, because some of us actually know people who are on that list. There are friends and collaborators. Um, and so uh, whatever the politics of the list are and who brought them out, basically it started as a list of 60 men, academics, who were named by female and in some cases some male identifying students as being sexually abusive in, the, in academic spaces. Uh, what's happened with that list is it's grown. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the politics of naming and shaming. And um, I think what's, what kind of struck me or has kind of stayed with me is um, the list is actually, I think, something about um, information in aggregate. I don't know if it's about like individual um, struggles for justice and holding this or that academic to account. I mean, I think it would be great if people who are abusive are kind of named and shamed and, you know, things are done about it. But I think there's something about just this, this growing number of, of men who are being named. Um, and it's something that I, I think about and struggle with a lot, especially since things are happening with, with certain academics who have certain kinds of visibility. Um, so yeah, it's, it's actually, I, I just want to kind of throw out this idea of like using technology, and especially because they were young women mm -hmm. who put this out. And um, yeah, I think there's, I, I'm curious to hear how people would respond to um, the politics of using technology to make violence visible, and what is the outcome of that? Anyone else like to? Weigh in. Um, well, when you talk about, you know, the list, I, um, I think of a very different list. I think of um, a list of names of black lesbian women in South Africa, you know, who were murdered um, because they're black and lesbian. And um, about the point you raised the day before yesterday about visibility and invisibility. And how um, such, a, such a list of names, how you know, students in a classroom respond to such a list of names because they hear about one story or another story but when you put the stories together as a political story, um, it, you know, it really shifts their thinking. And um, there is a different way of working with technology, right, in order to see the political rather than see it as single stories. Can I Keep going. Sure. say something else which is not related to the list? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm list. Ra Raquel and I were talking this morning and I was very struck by her talking about communitarian weaving. Mm 
yesterday. And that for me, so, so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm threading a line of thought between some of yesterday, the day before, and today. So anyway, so she, she spoke about communitarian weaving as a practice of solidarity, a practice of resistance. And I thought about the way in which communitarian weaving connects to the Fanonian concept of sociogenesis and to Tim Ingold's idea of wayfaring, how we lean on each other as we make ourselves human, and, and how communitarian weaving and sociogenic wayfaring challenge Etienne's notion of the genealogical scheme. Okay, so racisms and their reproduction for me are about lines, straight lines, borders, lines of domination, lines of exclusion, straight lines, lines of inheritance, okay? Um, Whereas communitarian weaving and sociogenic wayfaring are not about straight lines. And I want to just read this um, uh, one line from Tim Ingold, which I found, which I find so, so powerful. Um, genealogy or the genealogical line traces the paths of human life from their ancestral sources or roots to their contemporary manifestations. No other kind of line has exercised such a hold on the disciplinary imagination. And so for me, I think what is really important is that we need to shift our way of thinking away from lines and particularly away from straight lines. And that for me links to the question of freedom that came up in the, just the previous panel. That we think about freedom as what, what one can do, what one can say, how one can do it, say it, and why. But what we don't think about is what Raquel raised this morning in our conversation is, what is it that you cannot do and say? And why is it that you cannot do and say certain things? So for example, why is it not okay to express one's freedom of speech through the bullet on the body of another? And I think that is a question, the, the, the what one cannot do is what we, need to, what we need to focus on. And in relation to, to gender and race, I mean, what I found um, really insightful is Sylvia Winter's argument that all of our struggles, all of our struggles are about one struggle the struggle of man, with a capital M, A-N, Eurocentric man, versus the human. And this conception of man as the representation of what it means to be human is actually born of war and born of violence. And so I see the image of the women armed and I ask myself, um, what does that mean? You know, what does it mean for a woman to wear military garb? 
I was thinking about the dispute of visibility in terms of, um, I think that today financial devices, especially through debt, for example, offer to women uh, a fin financial inclusion as a way of visibility. So I think that this is um, one, uh, one way uh, in which we have to confront a certain kind of offer of visibility. And the second one, I, I think that is uh, through NGOs and especially um, this new kind of pink washing of different um, marketings. I am thinking in concrete terms in Argentina, in, for example, uh, in Benetton. No? Benetton is the owner of the land, in the, the, the big owner on, uh, of lands in Patagonia, and um, the same, uh, this, this land is the territory in conflict with Mapuche indigenous communities. And in the, in the same time that this conflict is uh, taking place, Benetton um, launched a campaign, it's a purple campaign, that we, all, we are all feminists. Uh, so at the same time, for example, you, you see in Argentina these uh, big campaigns in buses, in shops and television, etc and the repression to the, to the Mapuche community. Mm -hmm. At the same time, with the... Uh, is, is, I think that is uh, very dangerous how this um, idea of visibility is uh, used by this kind of uh, new forms of inclusion of gender vocabulary, gender uh, uh, agenda, and especially uh, through these kind of new forms of inclusion of the excluded. The, um, I think for me, I feel like a lot of the people that I work with um, are doing feminist work. A lot of the people that I, um, and I consider myself part of that work, but I'm finding it increasingly difficult to figure out how to bring together different strands of feminist political history mm -hmm. together. And, I, and I'm, I'm wondering if other, if other people are struggling with finding some sort of frame for a contemporary feminism that can articulate it straightforwardly. <laughs> So, you know, on the one hand, we have this incredibly important Marxist feminist history that takes shape uh, predominantly around the question of wages for housework. And, uh, right, uh, and I think we can't speak about <laughs> in this conversation without speaking about that, um, that enormously important mobilization. And I think the conditions for that still persist. Mm. Right? I mean, the, the, you know, women still own a tiny percentage of wealth in the world and do most of the reproductive uh, labor of the world. So the conditions for this still persist, but there's something about wages for housework that hasn't, doesn't seem like it can grasp at that anymore. Or it should be able to, but it doesn't, right? So there's a kind of slippage mm -hmm. of the way in which a feminist politics doesn't seem to be able to obtain. Um, and so much of the feminist much of feminist work has moved into this terrain of visibility and recognition. Um, and so the LGBTIAQ, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, has come to take over uh, much of the fe feminist vocabulary, which is interesting. And I, I think it's, of course, very important work and speaks to um, the kinds of gendered violence that, 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 is, that is absolutely operational in the world. But it seems like this, the kind of Marxist feminist tradition which thinks about those deeper and internationalist structures of, of labor has been eclipsed by a politics of recognition and feminism, both of which are very important, but it seems increasingly difficult to hold them together. And I, um, I wonder how we, 
how we do that uh, and how we how we do that well. Um, and sometimes it represents itself as a kind of debate between, you know, Nancy Fraser and Judith Butler, which seems mm -hmm. like it, it, <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't, I mean, it, it's important, but it doesn't do much in terms of moving us forward. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something about how the, you know, maybe like the, the, you know, there is no, alt it seems like there is no alternative to the march of capitalism right now, um, and we don't have the terms to really mm. define and, and, mm. and, 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 and grasp capital. Mm. And that's what we were looking for in our conversation yesterday. So the capitalism is exploding, and yet the terms to be able to describe and, and resist it seem like we're trying to catch mm. up. Similar, similarly, patriarchy is, is you know, ever-present marching forward, maybe even more vicious <laughs> under contemporary conditions of capitalism. Also, as men lose the, the stable work and you know, are at home more, and the viciousness of that, that affront is also played out often on the bodies of women um, in an increasingly vicious machismo um, that doesn't allow for men to participate in the reproduction of care, but actually sets up more intense relationships around the re reproduction of households. Um, but increasingly, it feels like there's a lot of slippage in the way in which we articulate a feminist project in the explosion of, of, of masculinist politics in the world. So maybe, maybe it's just to say I, I, I find it, even though I feel like many of us are involved, it becomes difficult to know how to mm. articulate a politics in relationship to that. Uh, can I just add a, a sort of complication of this, mm. which I think is implicit in your uh, remark anyway, and that is um, uh, the globalization of, um, of caretaking, right? Yeah, exactly. so, so domestic labor is not just domestic in one sense of the domestic, right? Uh, the national domestic. Um, and it raises the complexity in Kalindi's question that she ended with yesterday about who do you take care of, which is not unconnected to, but a different question than who do you care for and what do you care about, mm. right? And I think those three things need to be held complexly together uh, sort of in relation to each other. Okay, so, so I think I want to say one thing that, that may be controversial, but I want to say it anyway. Um, and, and it's approaching the sort of feminist question tangentially, um, as in, I want to think here about the importance of, you know, of what Lauren Berlant says, of thinking not just with structures, but with atmospheres. And so I want to think not just of the structure of racism, but the atmospherics of whiteness, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to think about that as someone who's, you know, privileged male and inhabiting the United States at this moment. So I just thought I would give you two quick anecdotes and then read one paragraph I wrote at the end of the day yesterday as I was trying to process <laughs> things for myself, right? So, so one anecdote is this. Um, shortly after the 2016 election, some medical students at the University of Chicago came to me um, asking me to help them think through an initiative that the medical school was organizing on conversations around inclusiveness, right? And they wanted to help think through how to make this conversation more radical. They wanted not an insurrectionary politics, but an institutional and a constitutional one, but they wanted this to not be a banal conversation, and so we started thinking about how do you incorporate a critical race pedagogy into the medical school curriculum? And to that end, we went and talked to one of the deans of the medical school, right? And the dean said that the marginalized community that we are most concerned about at this moment on campus are white conservatives. This was on a Friday, 10 days after the 2016 election. Four days previously, on the Monday, our campus had been plastered with swastikas. And uh, the Center for Race and, and, and Gender and Sexuality was especially targeted by the swastika campaign. Um, this dean had a copy of Paolo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed oh. in a bookshelf. So the second, the second anecdote is a few weeks ago, I became a US citizen. And as part of the oath-taking ceremony, this was on the Tuesday after Shithole Gate. And as part of the oath-taking ceremony, the judge wanted to make a speech, and the judge said, 
there are 100, it's very important for me to say at this time that there are 110 of you from 38 countries in this room, and so I want to read out the names of all of the nationalities who are represented, and he read out all 38 countries, starting with Australia and Benin and ending with Zimbabwe. And he said, it's very important for you to know that you're not becoming a citizen because of your wealth or your social status or your educational qualifications, but because of a commitment to an ideal. And it's very important for you to know that I was born an American and you're becoming an American, but my citizenship doesn't mean anything more than your citizenship. And I hope that as you become a citizen of our country, you won't leave your cultures and traditions and memories behind. This judge was a George W. Bush appointee, right? And so as I want to think about the atmospherics of whiteness, I want to think about the fact that America is a complex place yeah. where people don't act out the subject positions that their bookshelves <laughs> or their appointments <laughs> indicate. Yeah. And one has to learn to live within that. Yeah. And just before the election, a close friend of mine, a woman, asked me, she said, uh, do you trust white people? And I think this is a feminist question because she didn't say, do you trust whiteness? I would have said no. Mm -hmm. She said, do you trust white people? It was an embodied question, and so I still don't know how to answer that question because white people are my friends and my neighbors and my students, and they're implicated in these complex relationships. So this was the paragraph that I wrote, and then I'll, I'll stop as I was trying to think through this. Um, I believe it is more important than ever to discern the atmospherics of the situation as much as the structure of it. And atmospheres are highly contingent and specific. It is not the same in the American university as the South African one, and to attend to specificities is not the same as engaging in American or South African exceptionalism. Atmospheres are labile and fragile, and they can become toxic very quickly in ways that can be hard to decontaminate. I am not advocating for a politics of compromise, but a politics of hegemony. This has to involve building the terms of conversation with the privileged as much as with the subordinated. Has to involve understanding not just the structures of power, but its affects. Has to involve a recognition of not just the differentiating capacity of power, but its own differentiated nature. To dehumanize power is simply to consolidate it. One has to take adversarial sentiments seriously, which is not the same as acquiescing to them without pushback. In these times more than ever, I have to learn to push back pedagogically rather than antagonistically. This is not a politics of compromise, it is a politics of friendship. It is thick with the probability of betrayal. It is not easy and it is not innocent, but it is vital in these times, not least to confront the question of race in ways that are not simply a descent into violence. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, I think we have a lot of <laughs> have a lot um, on the table now. I would just like to to add on um, one thing, which I think really also works well with the politics of friendship and the notion of the overcoming the overrepresentation of man. Sylvia Winter, uh, Zimitri referring to Sylvia Winter. Um, yeah, especially also in feminist politics that do not consider care just as a household thing. But, um, and that's why, why I mentioned how does this analysis can go beyond capitalism's underlying separation of pr pr production and social reproduction to think of care in terms of, and there we can draw it back to abolition in, der in terms of abolitionist uh, justice or, uh, or as Ruth Wilson Gilmore has referred to abolitionist uh, geographies in terms of how do we care um, against the background of secure, securitization? How do, can we not individualize um, interpersonal violence in terms of, for example, rape, sexualized violence without calling upon the state? Um, what Sultan also, how can we emerge politics, politics of friendship without calling upon the state? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that and now open it up um, for discussion. Israeli, 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 Israeli,
to dominate this with the kind of same archive that I kind of carry around uh, my mind. But uh, since you also mentioned me, Vanessa, I was wondering, you know, um, the feminist question was opened up 15 years ago by Sabah Mahmoud, who showed us that feminism can have an ethical quest and can actually point at ways to work on oneself, cultivate oneself, cultivate community, and go beyond a kind of binary politics of like a body wanting to be, you know, uh, wanting to deserve rights from a state, but in fact be, have, have a whole kind of community and um, selfhood that can, you know, stand strong of sorts. I was wondering if this at all plays a role in this feminist question in this, in this panel, and I'm also thinking about what you really beautifully presented us about the wayfair, you said, about making lines, be, being together, kind of waving, that, you know, making communities, standing together, um, providing some kind of resistance to these like straightening lines, right? Um, there comes up the question, what are these straightening lines? I mean, we have these big categories, capitalism, neoliberalism, I say state, secularism, I would, I would add. Uh, yesterday evening there was a talk by Nilufar Göller, who is also sitting here in the room about religion, the role of religion, and I think it's important to see other resources, other archives. Again, I mean, I feel um, the secular becomes very naturalized in these conversations, and I'm not sure if this is happening on some kind of like conviction or just assumption or a premise. I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah, a week ago today, uh, she was very close to a number of us in the room, so it's a wonderful way to mark her presence and her absence. Um, is it working? Yeah. Okay, I have also a question. Um, you mentioned the Me Too campaign, and um, there was another campaign here in Germany, or there still, that um, refer at this, but it's from a far right movement, from the Identitären, and they uh, use this um, Me Too campaign for drawing picture of a criminal Muslim man. They use women's rights as a tool for producing racism and hate, and um, against minorities and um, it's also what the, the right uh, party here in the parliament now does, and which you can see, I think, also in other European countries. But um, my, my question is, um, they are not feminists for sure. They, they, uh, pick, they, they see their, their view of uh, uh, at a, at the woman and family is far right and conservative, but um, what can be a strategy of us feminists um, and uh, anti-racist activists mm against uh, this using women rights for, for their racist propaganda. Mm -hmm. Maybe we collect one more question and then um, if there is one more question. <laughs> I'll remark. Yes, oh, Nishan. Uh, uh, two more. And uh, Nishan, oh, we, yeah. we can get one. Um, as much as I agree, Kaushik, with what you said or I thought it was very beautiful, I also applaud it. Um, I wanted to go back to this question of politics of friendship versus the politics of antagonism. Mm -hmm. Now I understand, I guess, or I think I understand what you're saying, but I am also thinking that if we discuss, if you talk about racism, racism as a structural or an institutional form, it means it it affects us all, and if you discuss racism, it's something is at stake, and that is conflict. And while I understand why one would say, you know, you can't just say everybody belongs just in, if if the if the project of a politics is, is to establish some form of, uh, not just to define where everybody's placed and where sort of uh, and and define those belongings or those, uh, but still I think there is something, and I say that from a perspective of classroom. That there's, I feel there's in classroom, but also at large, a, a sort of an unlearning of actual engagement, understanding politics as something that has to do with conflict and with problems and not with agreement or 
simply or, or disagreement and then that's that, right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to hear as, as much as I think I understand what were you talking, speaking against, I'm still wondering about that because I mean at the first day, two days ago, the first panel was around racism, was on racism and I was kind of missing, I'm, there, this is, this is sort of, that's the tough stuff and it doesn't seem to emerge as a sort of, as that what is at stake and that is conflict and that is uh, rupture and, and so that is also something to understand. I mean, if I go back, I mean, my, my, my sort of history of, of, as a political person is filled of failures and misunderstandings and actual conflicts only through those I learned and not through agreement. I mean, that's also, right, we all need also those promising moments of something that's uplifting, some struggles that actually lead to something. Yes, but um, yeah, so antagonism, friendship, and then something else, I guess. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how to ask this question, but I think it has something to do with um, the problems of recognition that run through, in, in, I really like thinking about this visually as a line, <laughs> that run through who we end up um, recognizing as having contributed to some of the, let's just take the feminist uh, question of feminisms uh, as the example through which to discuss this, but who we end up recognizing and reading and discussing and all of the hierarchy that's, and racism that's in, involved in that. And I suppose this is kind of, um, in a way, taking from Ru Ruthie's comments yesterday, um, about traditions, um, but you know, when we think about, when I think about the question that you raised, Kelly, um, you know, I think that there, there, you know, one reason for why the Wages for Housework campaign hasn't had the hold that we might have hoped is because there was a backlash, at least in the UK context, against the Wages of Housework campaign by a lot of middle class white feminists who did not want to valorize housework. Mm -hmm and who's, you know, who had a very strong position of, no, we want to get out of the house. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is not something we support. And that kind of, um, you know, we can call it a kind of white feminism has, has really predominated in places like the UK. Yeah. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean that there's not a very rich tradition of Marxian anti-racist feminisms, which is not just, uh, you know, my reference points are very much of that kind of work coming out of North America and the UK, but of course this is very much the case all over the place. Um, work that's been produced and written in academic forms that somehow has disappeared. So we have this reappearance of a discourse of social reproduction feminism when women of color have been documenting and writing about the exploitation of women of color migrant domestic workers for decades. You know, and so I, you know, I have a question about how, about, you know, trying to also be a little bit more reflexive in our conversations about academia, which is very much an industry, uh, and you, sites, of, sites such as the university where um, you know, at least in the UK, a kind of neoliberal logic of higher education has firmly taken hold to the point where, you know, on most days I don't see the university. I'm lucky because I teach at a, a very progressive, you know, uh, school, SOAS, but most days I don't actually see the university as anything more than a site that's there to produce the, reproduce the status quo, which of course many people have critiqued the university for decades mm -hmm. for being that site. So then, uh, I'm not saying it's a hopeless cause, but let's put it in perspective. Um, and you know, I think part of the way, part of what academia has become is, you know, is, is it, you know, is, is culpable in this invisibilization of certain kinds of work and the marginalization of this work. And my worry is that we end up trying to constantly reinvent the wheel yeah. because this work has been done. Uh, and it's, it's evident when we leave the university and actually go and try and do, you know, uh, 
more community-oriented or activist-oriented work in, in, in different sites. So one becomes acutely aware of, of how distant some of the conversations that we have in university spaces are from what, you know, when we call, when we talk about the subordinated, what, what their everyday conditions of life, you know, living are, are actually about. And I actually, you know, some of the things I've been doing recently have also realized that all of these problems of intersectionality that we want to keep talking about are not a problem some <laughs> people Absolutely. in some communities. It's, it's just very obvious the way that race and class are laminated onto one another or, or how certain situations are gendered and sexist and patriarchal. So I just wanted to kind of, you know, put that out there. Sure. Yeah, just Okay, we have one more. Um, yeah, it's to your left. Yeah, thank you. Right, well, Nishan, can you keep it yeah. as short as possible? I, 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 will, I will try and keep it very short. And thanks so much for that prompt because I'm kind of piggybacking on what you already said. I think one of the things that I want to touch upon is the notion of the list and this idea of how it's becoming impossible to reconcile the various histories and voices of feminisms in specific spaces that Kelly brought up. Mm -hmm. um, um, and very quickly, because what's happening in, in countries like India is that the minute something like the list actually appears, what you have is two sides of uh, warring factions, where on the one side is academic feminism, which is interested in reproducing itself. And on the other side are people who refuse to call themselves feminists, but are doing women's rights work, uh, and, 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 and not concentrating on the genealogy of feminism, but the futurism of feminist movement. Uh, and so there's like this contradiction which needs to be perhaps put into place saying it's maybe time to let go of the tyranny of history and start thinking about futurisms and the, and the ways in which it might bring around different intersectional politics to come together and what would be the strategies towards that. Because I do a lot of work with young activists who are like sometimes 15 and 16 and would never call themselves feminists but often do some of the most intensive care and labor work that is required for women's rights movements in, and, and queer rights movements in specific contexts. So I would be very curious to hear about reproduction and futurisms as opposed to merely reproduction and the historicization of it. Thank you. Thank you. Were there any questions back here? We can't really see you way back. But, um, <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, there's one, one last question. No? no? Okay. Okay. Any quick responses? I want to actually uh, remind us of something that uh, Francoise brought up a few days ago to sort of try and, you know, respond to this idea that th these things are not separate. And, you know, the person talking about the Me Too campaign being appropriated or co-opted by far-right groups in Germany, that uh, why, uh, Francoise was saying that while the Catherine Deneuve-inspired, um, I mean, she was the most visible name, kind of your right to have... Uh, you know, your ass grabbed is, is, you know, kind of valorized in some way against this whole Me Too thing, while that sort of caught the media cycle because, well, that, that's how, that's how, that's what was in the news. Um, another more important struggle was taking place of like, I think it was workers in the Gare du Nord who actually won a case against a racist, sexist, uh, you know, kind of bosses that they had, and that was kind of nowhere there. I mean, I kind of really um, understand what Prerna is talking about when there's certain kinds of things that are not, with, or as Nishant also said, we want to reproduce certain ways of understanding what the struggle is, but actually there are things happening in, in other places, and you can't kind of have a feminist movement that is also, or a feminist practice that's not anti-racist, anti uh, can't have one without the other. But the thing, and also to respond to what Nishant was saying about futurism, the thing that actually Actually gives me a lot of hope is I like these um, things that are happening that may be seen as very individualized um, or about intersectionality, but they're kind of breaking language in some ways, and I like things that break language. So, for example, uh, the personal pronouns, the change in personal pronouns, uh, mm -hmm. and people Thanks. saying, please acknowledge that what your personal pronoun is, that I am uh, trans or I am cis, I am they, them, uh, she, her, he, him, and I think I really like the kind of struggle that I encounter every time I have to do this because it's saying, you know, I actually don't know. And this is different from, you know, the whole history of feminist sort of practice and theory around how we understand gender. And I like that young people are saying, 
um, let's, let's queer that, let's really queer that and say, I don't need to be able to look at you and understand who you are and what you are. And it's like that question that you know, many people of color will get in many parts of the world, like where are you actually from? <laughs> Um, so where are you originally from? Uh, it's, it's like that with gender, and I think that I would appreciate that kind of thinking forward as well with these things that make us uncomfortable. I can say something about the, the friendship issue. Look, I think friendship is inherently conflictual, and I think it's conflictual with a constitutive risk of betrayal. So I think the stakes of the conflict are high. I can fight my enemy without worrying about betraying him, but every word that I say to a friend contains within it the risk of betrayal. So I don't want to hear an articulation of friendship as being somehow a kind of quiescent politics, but in fact a deeply fraught and conflictual one. And the reason I'm putting it on the table circa, um, you know, circa today in America is that I think America has very few white nationalists, but many, many white supremacists, right? People who think that football players who take the knee while singing the national anthem shouldn't do so because they're letting politics get in the way of sport. They're white supremacists, but they're not white nationalists. People who say affirmative action is bad, they're white supremacists, but they're not white nationalists. And these people who are white supremacists, they're my neighbors and my friends and my students, and I have to learn how to inhabit with them, right? So, so after the election, my best friend, who is a staunch Bernie Sanders supporter, resolutely anti-Trump, called me, lamented at great length, and, and then said in the same breath, but of course Hillary lost because Black Lives Matter didn't call themselves All Lives Matter. And at that point, I have a choice. I have a choice of either saying, how could you not know this yet, or, or even, how dare you say that? Or I have a choice to teach. And what choice I make has political consequences. And I cannot afford to live my life in America today having his prior knowledge and understanding of Black Lives Matter be the price of admission to my friendship. Right. Mm. Yeah. yeah um, yes, I, I agree with you entirely. This, you know, the notion that you know, a, a politics of friendship mm -hmm. is necessarily harmonious is, um, I think it's pie in the sky, you know. Um, and um, it is precisely that, it is precisely through that moment of conflict and moment of disagreement that we are, as I mentioned earlier, leaning against one another in the process of learning, right, the, um, what, what the other thinks and why and how that leaning, which requires listening, as Raquel, you know, emphasized, how that can shift our friends' perspectives of the world. And I, uh, that, for me, is the most difficult skill to acquire, is how do you have an absolutely fraught and difficult conversation? with someone who is close to you about these matters. It's a really interesting conversation. We should, yeah. we, we should have after, we should continue. The, the, the to lack have. of publics and the <laughs> lack of being in common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah I, I, I really take the point that um, sometimes things are worked out in the ongoing work of struggle that answers some of these questions in ways that they absolutely aren't answered. And I, I absolutely agree with you on that. Um, but I, I was actually thinking very much about two instances of struggle, uh, feminist, well, people who were searching for terms of feminist language in struggle in, you know, one a uh, close comrade of ours, uh, who's probably one of the most important women activists in South Africa right now, is, is the chairperson of the Housing Assembly, which is a really very strong and growing, uh, you probably know, I'm not sure, of the organization in South Africa. And she's, she's trying to articulate something of a feminist politics within the Housing Assembly, and she has no idea what terms to look for and how to do it. Right, so she's trying to understand what it is, and she's trying. So she, it's not that she's not doing feminist work, or she's not herself 
a kind of very important woman leader of struggle, but she ca she's, she's trying to look for resources to help articulate a feminist politics within the context of a very important housing struggle. And she's struggling to know how to do that. And so, so it's, it's, maybe I wasn't clear, it's not that it's not happening, but how we frame or articulate a kind of, um, I don't know if transferable is the right way, but a movable, um, uh, contagious <laughs> set of terms for a feminist politics. This is more what I was trying to describe. It's not that, uh, that there isn't feminist politics happening and that there, there aren't terms being invented, but that there's something about that the contagion of those terms seems to be stuck or uh, unable to move in ways that we, that, that, that we might want them to move for the kind of patriarchal order that we're living in. That's more. It's the sort of it's sort of moments of abstraction that aren't that aren't contained within the academy, but that are, you know, another the other example I was thinking of is that, um, you know, there are a whole bunch of black lesbian activists in South Africa right now that are uh, calling themselves human rights defenders because this was the program, that the UN program that came to South Africa to teach. Les black lesbian activists about what they are and what they mm. should be, right? <laughs> and so, you know, human rights defenders became, and so this, this was the term that found itself in their mouths, which was weird and unsettling and problematic, but it was the banner under which they were, and, and that w there wasn't an alternative feminist language available by which they could artic articulate a critique against that. So it's this, it's like, what is the transferability of a feminist language and, a f and feminist mm. resources? It's not that it's not there, but it, I don't know, there, there hasn't been the work to find that contagious language sufficiently. I think this was more my point, yeah? Yes, I, I, I think that language as a battleground of feminism, as you were talking about, is very powerful. But I think that now we are also um, feeling that um, a popular feminism is emerging yeah. in different conflicts. Yeah. And the uh, feminist there is uh, a practical toolkit to interpret and to connect sexual violence with political and especially economic violence. And I think that is, um, this connection function uh, in a landscape of general crisis of reproduction. So this, uh, yeah. I think, this is the, the, the matter of violence, yeah. like yeah. A, a really great landscape. Um, and I think that uh, when people, but especially women, are in the front line of conflict, for example, of eviction of lines or um, exploitation in workplaces, but also in territories with these financial devices of indebtedness. I think that is uh, a practical element of a critique of political economy that is uh, forged or imposed by uh, these feminist practices. And I, I think that this is very new in the way that is um, weaving this uh, communitarian and popular perspective that Raquel was talking about. I think, I mean, I just want mm. to throw in mm. one last thing in response mm. to, to this, that I think that there are so many things actually going on that weave these strands together and are mm. teaching us things, but you have to always keep looking for them and, and finding them and finding ways to support mm. them. Um, last month, I went to New Orleans for an artificial intelligence conference, and um, the first thing that I, the, the kind of news from New Orleans, the first thing I read was this really incredible story about infrastructure, mm. um, but it was... It, it, was a, it was a really interesting story about infrastructure because it was, a, it was just before Mardi Gras and the city of New Orleans wanted to um, improve the infrastructure in the French Quarter. They wanted to make it better. They wanted to clean up and tidy up a lot of things. That included um, cleaning up the sex work, which mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. Mardi Gras in mm -hmm. that space mm -hmm. is very much known for. So the first thing that I actually saw on my Twitter feed when I kind of got out and 
uh, was uh, from Melissa Gira, who writes, who's a journalist mm -hmm. and writes a lot about sex work in addition to other things as well. And uh, she was trying to come to New Orleans to cover this protest. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, I'm actually here. I can just kind of go and see what the protest mm -hmm. is about. And it was sex workers who were really articulating their economic rights mm -hmm. and the, the right to their mm -hmm. livelihood and the fact that the city they also are part of the city's infrastructure mm -hmm. of something mm -hmm. like Mardi Gras. Mm -hmm. and I didn't actually get to talk to anyone because of the, the, the timing and when the protests were happening. But I think that I would have really, I mean, I've been following that story and trying to look at who's, who's uh, coming up with language in that mm -hmm. space, who's mm -hmm. supporting, mm -hmm. how is it being reported, what is it a question of, actually. And so, I, I, yeah, I think that those, those things are there. They're, they're actually well articulated in those spaces. Mm -hmm. may not always be intelligible to us mm -hmm. on the outside, but we have to kind of notice that they're happening, like the Gardunod um, example as well. Mm -hmm.